one of England's greatest kings and a successful military leader. He was an inspiration to his men and personally brave. He would march his 6,000 strong army across northern France to trounce the flower of the French aristocracy, despite being outnumbered by five to one. Shakespeare was right to paint him as a hero, but that's not the whole truth about Henry V. He was also ruthless and blatantly flouted the rules of medieval warfare. I'm Major Gordon Corrigan, and I've always been fascinated by military leadership. In this program, I'm looking at Henry V. How did a king transform himself into a military leader truly worthy of being considered one of Britain's greatest commanders? In the 15th centuries, there was intense rivalry between England and France. English kings claimed the French throne, and at times ruled parts of what is now France. These dynastic struggles became known as the Hundred Years' War. By 1415, there'd been 19 years of truce, but now civil war was raging in France. Henry V would use this to spectacularly advance his own claims. So how did he achieve this? In my opinion, one reason for his amazing success is that he started young. He commanded his first band of troops when he was still only a teenager. Henry was born in Monmouth Castle in 1387. And at the age of only 16, he commanded 3,000 of his father's troops at the vicious little battle of Shrewsbury where, although he was badly wounded in the face, he refused to leave the field. It was a brave start, and Henry would get the chance to consolidate his skills and reputation during the Welsh Rebellion in the early 1400s. Fighting the nationalist Owen Glendower, Henry would learn the business of waging war, skills that would transform him into a brilliant leader before he was even 21. But it was a tough lesson. It's important to understand the difficult terrain in Wales and the harsh conditions, so he'd have learnt a lot about the need to motivate men and to keep them well supplied. Logistics, I suppose we'd call it uh, today. Henry would learn something else which would prove really useful in years to come. How to cope with the tough conditions of war. During the Welsh Rebellion, several important castles in Northern Wales were taken and they had to be recovered by siege operations. And Harlech's a good example. It took literally years to wear down the resistance. And that was a hard learning experience for Henry, sitting in the damp siege lines. It, it's no better than the trenches of the First World War. But one of the most relevant lessons he learned was that determined men on foot properly disciplined and organized, can see off mounted knights, however well-bred those knights may be. But perhaps most important of all, he learned how to inspire men to fight and die for them in an age when loyalty couldn't be taken for granted. And he would need that loyalty more than ever when in 1413 he was crowned King Henry V. His dream was to rule over both England and France, and he would spend the rest of his life at war with the French in pursuit of that dream. But his first expedition to achieve this almost ended in disaster. In Wales, Henry had learned that foot soldiers could be the equal of knights, and now he put that lesson into practice. Henry was a professional soldier, and he demanded the same standards from his men. He recruited 10,000 paid, full-time, professional foot soldiers, the majority of them archers, to invade France. Henry understood the importance of surprise, and he kept his destination a secret until the last moment. Everybody expected him to head for Calais, which was, after all, an English possession, but instead he landed here, near Harfleur. 
Harfleur was one of the keys to Normandy and would give Henry a base from where he could conquer the rest of Normandy. After that, he'd strike up the Seine, straight for Paris. In Harfleur, Henry showed all the qualities of a great leader. There isn't much left of the town's defences now, but in 1415, Harfleur was a very tough prospect. It was only a small town, but it had strong walls and fortified gateways, surrounded by a deep moat. The French had no intention of surrendering to Henry, and a five-week-long siege began. In Harfleur, Henry showed his leadership by laying down the standards of behaviour for the campaign. Looting, burning, molesting the civilian population were all banned. As Henry was claiming to be recovering his own lands, he could hardly tolerate the normal destructive tendency of the soldiers. Breaches of the rules were punishable by hanging. The men didn't like it, but it did get their grudging respect. I think what Henry has got is what we call nowadays grip. He's the first person, for example, to write a series of instructions for campaign, and it is tied in with his, his chivalry. He's the kind of person that you want as a warrior king. Now, that means sometimes he can seem harsh and even cruel by modern standards, but he has a very keen eye, a tactical eye, and the ability to inspire his troops by personal example. And what happened next? would test his leadership and their loyalty to the utmost. In medieval warfare, armies that kept on the move could stay reasonably healthy. But now, after a five-week-long siege, the army was hit by disease. It's a hallowed tradition of the Englishman abroad that he samples the local cuisine, eats far too much of it, and pays the penalty. And 1415 was no different. Henry's men tucked into the clams and the mussels and the oysters that grew in profusion in the waters around half low. The trouble was that the oyster beds were right next to the town's sewage outlet, and large numbers of the men started to go down with dysentery. 2,000 men died, and another 2,000 had to be sent back to England. Cheers. It's a measure of his skill as a great commander that even in the face of such losses, Henry retained the support of his sick troops. Together they toughed it out until the town was finally won, but it had cost them almost half of his men. Henry had half lure to show for his expedition, but precious little else. It was far too late in the year now to head for Paris, even if he'd had an army that was healthy and up to strength and the weather had turned wet and stormy. But he couldn't just sail back to England. He had to produce something to justify the expense of this first foray to France. Henry decided on a radical and daring plan to march his troops 150 miles north to the English city of Calais and conquer whatever he could en route. It would be the ultimate test of his command of logistics and his ability to motivate and discipline his already depleted army. So he enforced the rules he had laid down in Harfleur with an uncompromising harshness. It's a measure of his strength of character and leadership that he chose to hang a prized asset, an archer, caught looting a church, rather than let discipline slip. Henry was being shadowed by a French army, which grew bigger and bigger as each day passed, and which was determined that this English upstart would never get home. They guarded all the crossings over the river Somme to block the route to Calais. And in their own words, they were caught like sheep in a fold. They were in a hostile land, they were outnumbered, they were sick, and they were running out of supplies. At this point, Henry could so easily have abandoned his men, but he didn't. He was a tough, even harsh leader, but he cared for his men, and he would look after them, come what may. This is all that's left today of the castle at Bowes. Henry came here, 
and he did a deal with the castle garrison. He wouldn't burn the town at the bottom of the hill if they provided him with food. The English were given bread, but there was something else that they found in abundance at Bove, and that was wine. Now, the effect of large quantities of alcohol on empty stomachs would have been disastrous for discipline, and Henry forbade his men to have any. And when they asked why they couldn't fill their canteens, he said they would make bottles out of their bellies and get out of control. A great commander has to be a good disciplinarian, and once again Henry had proved the importance of it. In a cunning move, he now surprised the French with a sudden attack on a nearby town. It was a clever diversion, designed to hoodwink them into thinking he was intending to force a crossing over the Somme. In fact, he'd already found an undefended stretch elsewhere. Henry's army crossed here, near the village of Bethancourt, where the Somme was at its narrowest. Because crossing an obstacle made the army vulnerable, with a consequent risk of a breakdown of discipline and a loss of control, Henry personally supervised the operation. The archers came across first, up to their waists in water, followed by the rest of the army. When some French troops did come up, it was far too late and the archers saw them off. Henry had succeeded brilliantly in slipping his bedraggled army across the Somme long before the French could react. Sixteen days after setting out from Harfleur, on a march that was supposed to last only a week, Henry and his army arrived in the village of Maisoncelle. He could see the French army a mile away in the village of Agincourt, blocking the road to Calais. The French army numbered 30,000 men. Henry had only 6,000. If he wanted to get home, he would now have to fight. King Henry V was about to face his ultimate challenge. In his campaign to seize the French throne, he had led a regal-taggle army of 6,000 men in a miserable march across northern France. Now, as he set up camp near the village of Agincourt, he found his route home blocked by 30,000 Frenchmen. Now, more than ever, he would need the loyalty of his men. The few tents that the English army had were put up, and some of the senior commanders at least would have had a reasonably dry night. As for the rank and file, well, what's one more night in a wet and muddy field? But this is where Henry had to show what leadership is all about. The men were wet, cold and hungry, and yet not one man slipped away. Nobody said they were too sick to fight. Nobody suggested surrender. How did Henry do it? Quite simply, they trusted him. They knew that he was with them, that he knew his business, that he shared the risks, and come what may, he would do his best for them. And of course, if they did try to slip away, he'd have hanged them. On the morning of the 25th of October, 1415, the English army stared across the battlefield at the French. Henry was hideously outnumbered, but it would turn out to be his greatest victory. One of the reasons for this is a weapon that Henry would deploy to brilliant effect. The longbow was consistently underrated by England's enemies, and so they were consistently killed by it. It had a maximum range of up to 300 yards, and a rate of fire that wouldn't be equaled until the introduction of bolt-action rifles in the late 19th century. The secret was that English archers started practicing from childhood, and they developed the eye for a shot and the muscles needed to operate a bow that was as tall as a man and needed a hundred pound pole to draw. So first lesson, I prepare an arrow in your hand, yeah. two fingers, mm -hmm. and help yourself. Keep the arrow on my knuckle. Two fingers, the ear will be the best. It's actually <laughs> bloody difficult. Yeah. 
not terribly good. It's not so bad. It's very impressive at all. It's not so bad for a new archer. Mm -hmm. Now, a good archer, how many arrows could he shoot in a minute? And during medieval time, uh, 10 or 12 in a minute. And it was like a gun machine. It was very quick. And you may imagine here on the battlefield, uh, more than 6,000 people, archers, mm -hmm. in a minute, mm -hmm. sending tons of iron on the heads mm -hmm. of the knights. There are two very different armies at Agincourt. The English army was made up of full-time professional soldiers, whereas the French were just out for a day's sport with nobody wanting to take orders. The English army is commanded by King Henry V in Passon, in the centre, and he's flanked by dismounted men-at-arms and armoured knights. They're interspersed with archers, and in addition, there are two large wedges of archers on each flank. Altogether, about 6,000 men, of whom 5,000 are archers. On the French side, the French king, Charles VI, well, he's not here. He suffers from the unfortunate delusion that he's made of glass. And that makes military campaigning a bit difficult. So he's off in Paris. And reality, nobody's commanding the French army. They've got men-at-arms as well, in three lines. They've also got cavalry, with a contingent on each flank. They've got crossbowmen, but they're near the back, sandwiched between the second and third lines of men-at-arms. Altogether, about 30,000 French soldiers, outnumbering the English by five to one. Henry knew he had only two options, to go on the attack or surrender. But he wasn't one for giving up, even with the odds stacked against them. For a long time, the two armies stood on the field of Agincourt, waiting for the other to make the first move. And then, at about 1100 hours, Henry decided that he would have to provoke the French into attacking him. He ordered the royal banner forward, and the whole army began to advance. They moved quite slowly. Henry, conspicuous in the centre, in his golden helmet, and his crown. And when they got to about here, just within arrow range of the French, Henry ordered a halt. 300 yards away, there were 30,000 Frenchmen. And then Henry ordered his archers to unleash an arrow storm at long range. The French couldn't reply because their crossbowmen were at the rear and the arrows so incensed the French cavalry that they launched an all-out attack on the English line. It was exactly what Henry had been waiting for. 5,000 arrows every six seconds rained down, and hardly a single French horseman got anywhere near the English lines. Then the French infantry advanced, and Henry ordered the archers to unleash yet another deadly shower of arrows. Henry was a commander who led from the front, and now he thrust himself into the thick of the fighting. But still the English lines forced slowly back. Henry's decision to recruit archers, who trusted and respected him as a leader, now paid off. They were multi-skilled killing machines, prepared to do whatever their king demanded to win the battle. Casting aside their long-range weapons, they drew their knives and launched themselves into the thick of the fighting. The first French line recoiled and ran straight into the second one. It was chaos. By now, only the third French line were capable of doing anything, and they were still there, up on the skyline. So Henry sent a herald on a horse to tell them, go now, or there'll be no quarter. 
No quarter meant that no one would be allowed to surrender. They'd all be killed instead. And so the French third line, very wisely, withdrew. Assuming the battle's over, the English are sorting out the prisoners and plundering the dead, when suddenly there's a clash of arms from the rear. Is the English baggage line being attacked? And at the same time, elements of the French third line reappear. Henry had so far been a scrupulous upholder of the law, but now he would flout the rules of warfare in an act of total ruthlessness. Kill the prisoners, says Henry. The men-at-arms refuse. Live prisoners means ransom and money. Dead ones get you nothing. So Henry orders the archers to do it. And seeing this, the French third line just melt away. It's believed that some of the French dead were buried here by local monks. But why did Henry have the prisoners killed? It was a war crime then, as it would be today. Perhaps if we put ourselves in Henry's shoes, we can see the logic. Although he's seen off most of the French army, he's still greatly outnumbered. And if he's attacked again by that third line, and all these prisoners milling about pick up discarded weapons, then he can still lose the battle. So what he did was ruthless, but necessary nevertheless. The road to Calais and home was now open. Agincourt was a masterpiece of Henry's leadership and professionalism. The French death toll was massive, around 10,000 including half the nobility, at a cost to the English of 300 dead. So how did a greatly outnumbered, raggle-taggle army of cold, hungry and feverish soldiers trailing vomit and diarrhoea behind them in a foreign land manage to trounce the flower of the French aristocracy? Well, more than anything else, the English had a leader. A king who got in amongst them, who understood them, who shared their dangers, who inspired and motivated them, and who understood the business of waging war. The English used archers, whereas the French refused to believe that anyone other than a gentleman could have any decisive effect on the field of battle. But none of these would have made a difference if the English hadn't had faith in their leader, King Henry V. Agincourt wasn't the end of Henry's war, but his incredible victory so terrified the French that never again would they face him in open battle. Henry was eventually recognised as heir to the French throne in 1420, but his moment of glory was short-lived. He died two years later. We can't tell what might have happened if Henry had lived. Would Elizabeth II today rule over Great Britain and France? Well, probably not. But by his single-minded determination, his professionalism, his ability to inspire and to motivate, and his refusal to give up whatever the odds, Henry V showed that he was not only a great English king, but a great British commander too.